Hello everyone. It's time to begin chapter five, our chapter on sense, sensation, and perception. I personally find this to be an interesting chapter, though I don't think I did so much as an undergraduate. In this chapter, you'll learn how your various senses work. Uh, most of us, myself included, probably don't think much about them as long as they're functioning properly. But if you're born with an issue, or you acquire an issue, or maybe just through either accident or aging, you might spend a lot of uh, focus on the functioning of your senses. So let's learn how the senses work, how the process of sensation works, and how it all comes together in the process of perception. So let's start. Let's begin chapter five, our chapter on sense, sensation, perception. We'll start with senses. I'm going to not answer the how many until we get to the next slide. The answer might surprise you. But what are the senses? They're structures, they're physical parts of our body. And what they do is they receive energy or stimulation and then they code it into an action potential which can get sent to the brain for processing. Now sensation is the feeling we get when our senses are operating. We get this feeling because our brain has received the information and started the processing. Sensation is raw. It lacks the interpretation. It might be a sensation of a particular odor without being able to identify the odor yet, a sensation of something being on you, then sensation of a sound. So it's awareness of stimulation prior to the interpretation process, which we'll get to momentarily. So let's say that the brain has received sensory information and there's initial processing. There's awareness of a sound. If the processing stopped there, we could not survive. We need to know specifically what that sound is. Is the sound music coming from a neighbor's window that's open? Or is it a horn, horn maybe beeping telling us that we're in imminent danger? Perception is critical uh, for our survival. Perception is the last step in the process. Perception when the brain now interprets the sensory information. What is that smell? Uh, it's dinner. What is that sound? What is that touch? So perception pulls it all together and interprets the information. That makes it meaningful to us. The current slide defines sensation and perception in slightly different ways than the previous slide. So one slide or the other might make more sense to you, so just go with that particular way of conceptualizing it. In this one, sensation. The brain is going to receive input from the sensory organs. So she inhales the fruit, the molecules of fruit go up the nasal passage, are received at the top of the nasal, uh, nasal passage by the olfactory bulb, the receptor cells fire, send the information to the brain, and there'll be an awareness, a simple awareness. Now in perception, the brain is going to continue and that sensation is going to be processed and interpreted, such as this hopefully slightly humorous example. So the question posed on this slide, how many senses do we have, seems terribly simple and yet you're just probably now suspecting why is it being asked if it's as simple as I think, is there something going on here? Uh, your tuition, intuition is correct. Uh, the only incorrect answer would be five. And I know that your mind is going, no, 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 but it is actually correct. Uh, the only incorrect one is five. Before you go on, take a look at the term interoception, and we'll continue elucidating this surprisingly new, shocking way of looking at a very basic concept. As children, we were all taught there are five senses. And why we were taught this is that there are five outward collecting data senses. But that leaves out many, many other senses. So you should only say the five senses if you preface it with the phrase, the five classic or five classical senses. So let's consider the defensible answers, the correct answers. 
3, 9, 21, or even 33. 3, probably more basic than most of us would like, divides the senses into physical stimulus, that is light, chemicals such as smell and taste, and mechanical such as touch and hearing. If we were to increase our number to the nine senses, it would include some of the classic senses, vision, hearing, touch, taste, smell, pain, mechanoreception, which is not the same as mechanical in the above, temperature, and interoception, that new term that was introduced previously on the slide that started this whole uh, discussion. We'll consider 21 and 33 on our next slide. This slide elucidates where the answers 21 and 33 come from in terms of how many senses do we possess. So you can see 10 in the first column, 21 count in the second column, and 33 in the last column. You can take a look at it. It's interesting to view. Uh, you don't have to study uh, anything beyond the numbers, though. So let's see how you're doing with these concepts of sense, sensation, and perception. So for these examples, please determine, is it sense, sensation, or perception? Your eardrum and ear bones, well, that would be related to your sense of audition, so sense. You hear a complex, loud sound. You're probably saying sensation or perception. It would be sensation. The next step, when you interpret that complex, loud sound and say it's a black party and maybe feel happiness, well, that would be perception. The parts of the eye, well, that would be the sense related to vision. You're aware of something on your arm. That awareness is a sensation. The sensation occurs because the Markel cells, if you want to be fancy, the Markel discs in your arm fired when the ladybug walked on them. You feel pressure on your arm and realize, ah, it's a ladybug. Well, that's perception and interpretation of the sensation caused by that insect walking on your skin. Let's consider an area of psychology that studies sensory thresholds. There are two basic types of thresholds, absolute and difference. Absolute represents the smallest amount of something which can be reliably detected. The difference threshold, often referred to as JND, saying for just noticeable difference, the difference threshold is the smallest change in a stimulus that can be regularly detected, usually using the criteria of half the time. Consider the following two examples and decide is it an example of an absolute or different threshold. If you've ever had a hearing test in which you had the nod when you heard the sound, they were trying to identify your absolute threshold. In the second example, your friend apparently added more sugar to the concoction, but you couldn't detect any change in the sweetness of your beverage. Apparently, this was below your J and D, in other words, your difference threshold. What branch of psychology would study these thresholds? Well, there are two acceptable answers. One would be psychophysics, a field of psychology started by the gentleman shown on the slide, Gustav Fechner. Uh, he was actually doing his work before Wilhelm Wundt. The other appropriate answer would be the approach to psychology called Gestalt psychology, obviously a German approach. Let's consider human absolute thresholds. We'll start with a question on which of the five classic senses are our weakest. We'll find the answer when we work through these examples. For each one of these five classic senses, decide which would be the answer. Then you can check your answers against the next symbol. For vision, surprisingly, humans can detect a lit candle at a distance of seven miles. Olfaction, the term we'll learn for our sense of smell. Humans can smell one drop of perfume in 
a small house. For addition, a clock, a regular clock that is, ticking at a distance of 20 feet. Gustation, our fancy term for taste, which we'll learn, we can taste a teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water. Touch, a wing of a fly dropped on your skin from a distance of one quarter inch. So you might be tempted to say, ah, touch is our weakest sense. Actually, we can compare these mathematically and taste would be our weakest sense. Let's take a moment and think of the sensory experience of animals. Don't think that they experience the sensory world the same way we do. Obviously, dogs have a much keener sense of smell than humans. It varies from about 10 times as strong to about as 100 times as strong as a human. The bloodhound shown is at the extreme end of acuity about the 100 times. The entire shape of the dog has been designed to be able to smell better. Molecules of whatever it's tracking, whether it's a human or a prey, cling to its ears, its many folds in its coat. Let's consider birds. The mining bird on the right seems rather drab, solid black, with maybe a tiny bit of sheen, but look at what the fellow blackbird would see. Let's take a moment and consider the sensory world that animals experience. They do not experience the world the way we do. I've seen dogs have a much keener sense of smell. A a dog with a poor sense of smell might have a 10 times ability of a human. A dog such as a bloodhound shown here, its ability to smell would be about 100 times that of an average human. Indeed, the black, or even the bloodhound shape has been designed to enhance its ability to smell. The many folds in the ears, the many folds of flesh on the body catch the molecules of the prey that it is seeking. Let's consider what birds see. Obviously, birds are varied from species to species, but consider this minor bird. On the right, we see what we see, black with a little bit of sheen, but to a minor bird looking at another minor bird, brilliant colors. There are five sensory abilities that humans lack altogether, unless we use machinery we constructed ourselves to give us the ability. Many species see both ultraviolet and infrared, birds, for example. Rattlesnakes and pit snakes also do hunt in infrared, and even, believe it or not, hedgehogs have these abilities for unclear reasons. Many species can detect magnetic fields. This would include bees, and many sea creatures, such as sharks and turtles. Uh, fish have what's called a lateral line on their sides, which actually detects magnetic fields. Other species detect electric fields. Of course, the electric field would. Hmm. If you're a pet owner, you may consider once in a while the sensory abilities of your pets, but in general, we rarely think of the sensory abilities of other species. Animals do not experience the world the same way we do. Consider the dog. A dog with a weak sense of smell would have still a sensory ability of smell about 10 times that of a human. A dog with an acute sense of smell would have about 100 times the ability that of an average human. The bloodhound shown on the left is clearly on the upper end of the spectrum. Indeed, its entire body shape is designed to catch molecules of whatever it's searching for, whether it's a lost human or escaped prisoner. The long and very generously proportioned ears the many folds of flesh are all designed to catch the molecules, making them easier for the animal to smell. If we consider birds, the minor bird on the right looks rather drab to a human, black with a little bit of sheen to it, but a minor bird sees something very different, as shown in the perspective on the left. There are five sensory abilities that humans lack altogether. Well, unless you count what we can make with ourselves for ourselves with technology. Many species have both ultraviolet and or infrared. This would include many birds, as well as some snakes, such as the rattlesnake and the pit viper, and even for some reason, the hedgehog. Many species can detect magnetic fields. This would include bees, 
Many sea creatures, such as sharks, turtles, uh, some fish, and some migratory birds. Electric fields are also directly detected by some species, not surprisingly the electric eel, but all fish have what's called a lateral design, which can detect weak electrical fields. Sharks also hunt prey with using their electrical ability to detect fields. Consider the last one, echolocation, used by many cetaceans, such as whales and dolphins, but also used by bats. Let's now do a combination review, as well as introducing ourselves to new material. Consider our brain, the four lobes of our cerebral cortex learned in chapter three. Let's start with the occipital lobe in the rear. Which sensory ability? Ah, visual cortex. Let's now go up to the parietal lobe, shown in purple. You might remember we associate them with the somatic senses, the uh, body senses, that of touch, temperature, and pain. Consider the frontal lobe. We didn't identify smell with the frontal lobe, but we now will. That's olfactory sense. And we did not identify the sense of taste with the frontal lobe either, but let's do that so now also, so both smell and taste. Let's consider the temporal lobe by the ears. We said that we can hear tempos, we can hear oral things, and the temporal lobes which we hear with are by our ears, so we should definitely associate hearing, in other words, audition, with our temporal lobes. So take a moment and review those and learn the two new senses we of the classic five we snuck into our, our knowledge and test yourself on the next slide. So vision, we said that there would be the occipital lobe shown in pink in the rear. Hearing, we said we hear temporal things, tempos and oral things. And we hear with our ears, which would be where the temporal lobe is located, shown in that light green. So hearing, temporal lobe. Smell, that was our new addition for our frontal lobe. Somatic senses of touch, temperature, and pain, that would be the parietal lobe. And taste, that would be our new addition that we're going to associate with the frontal lobe. How did you do? While we were reviewing, did you notice the ball and the stem at the brace of the brain? Do you remember from chapter three, our fancy term for the ball? in that stem, take a moment and see if you can remember. The stem would be the medulla oblongata. What about the two balls that we have? They'd be the cerebellums. Let's start looking at our senses with a sense of vision. In class, students ask me if they should draw this particular uh, diagram. And for this one, I'll leave it up to you. I do suggest you draw the ear one for audition. But for this, if you think it's helpful, go ahead and draw it. If you don't, then I'm not going to overly suggest it. I'm going to randomly jump around to the parts mostly on the exterior and move gradually through the middle and to the inner part of the eye. Let's start with the part of the eye, which is the clear outer part. Which would that be? If you're thinking the cornea, you are correct. If you ever heard of a cornea transplant, my brother unfortunately had to have two of them. The cornea is the clear outer part of your eye. It needs to be clear and unscarred. If it's scarred, it'd be looking like looking through your window on maybe a very frosted day in the wintertime. You would not be able to see. If you ever had a corneal scratch or corneal tear, you know how very uncomfortable that can be. I ask most classes, and I'll usually have a student or two or three, and I ask them for a particular word to describe it. So if it's happened to you, think of what word you would use to describe the pain associated with it. Now, what about the white of the eye? It's interesting that most people know most of the parts of the eye, but not the whites. The whites do have a name. It's sclera. If you're looking at this particular overhead, it's in the back, but follow it. It does go all the way around to the front. So sclera is the fancy term for the white of the eyes. Remember that don't fire until you see the white of their eyes. Wouldn't have been nearly as poetic if they had used the technical term, don't fire until you see their sclera. Now, what about the black center? That'd be the pupil, but it's really not so much a thing as a doorway, an opening, an aperture. 
obviously the pupil can change in size. Sometimes it's smaller, sometimes it's bigger. <coughs> I'll let the dog start barking and get back to you. That's Bailey, the uh, foster dog, by the way. Well, hopefully Bailey's barking gave you a chance to think of that particular question. So obviously light makes it smaller. Uh, certain drugs make the pupil very small. Well, there's other drugs that make your pupil very large. Hence why police officers are always very concerned with the size of people's pupils. Also strong emotions, anger, rage, love, they all make for a bigger pupil size. What about the color band of tissue around the eye? Yours might be gray or green or very dark brown, hazel. That would be your iris. If you knew mnemonic, think of irises as being a very pretty colorful flower. Well, the iris would be the very pretty colorful part of your eye. Next, let's consider the lens. The lens is in the middle of your eye. And the job of the lens, as you'll see in the next slide, will be to focus the image on the back of the eye, or technically, on the retina. What do we call the condition when a person's lens becomes cloudy? It usually happens in late life. The condition indeed would be cataracts. And perhaps you know somebody that's had cataract surgery. Very easy if you're in a modern country. A little anesthesia on the eyeball while you're awake, a little incision, pop out the old lens, pop in a new one, and you're off to go in a couple hours with funky glasses. But in much of the world, cataracts occurs in populations, and even sometimes in very young populations. And it is a major cause of world blindness. It's a very good charity to give to. It's one that I just love to give to. A little bit of money can restore people's sight and make a profound change in their life. Now, if you look in this particular diagram, you'll see two humors, the aqueous and the vitreous. A humor is just a fluid-filled chamber. Your eye is inflated with humors. Now let's consider the vitreous humor. Sometimes it does not drain properly, causing too much pressure. You won't be able to feel it, but it will slowly take away vision. Do you know the disease associated with this issue? If you're thinking glaucoma, you are correct. Usually fixable with this medication given via eye drops, though sometimes it does require surgery. Next, let's consider the retina. The retina would be the layer of cells on the back of the eye. In a different slide, we'll consider some of the major players of the retina. The retina contains the neurons, specifically the sensory neurons for vision. Once they have been stimulated, the action potential will lead the eye through the optic nerve. The optic nerve will send it to the sensory relay center of the brain. Was that the thalamus or the hypothalamus? Hopefully you're thinking thalamus. So it'll go from the optic nerve to the thalamus and then it will go to the lobe of the brain for vision. Which lobe of the cerebral cortex is the visual lobe? Is it optical or occipital? Hopefully you'll say occipital. So if all goes well, and you will see well, but let's go to the next slide. And if you need the replay, this by all means, that's the advantage of recorded lectures. So here's a similar but uh, complementary vision of the eye you'll see that the eye in this particular overhead has a blind spot. The blind spot is a spot where there are no neurons for vision. So if an image falls on the blind spot, you will not be able to see that. We'll get a demonstration of this in a few slides. You also see in this particular overhead, the person is looking at an arrow and the lens is casting the image of the arrow on the retina. What do you notice about this image? It is upside down. So when a baby sees the world, what they see is upside down. We visually see the world upside down, but we don't perceive it. Remember perception? We don't perceive it as being upside down because our brain acts like a Photoshop, doing all sorts of things to enhance the image and also mentally rotating the image. Please take a few minutes, if necessary, and study the parts of the eye and what, they're, and what they do. And when you're done, try to label this particular diagram. So A would be the cornea, B would be the pupil, C might be easier to tell if it was colored in, but C would be the iris, D would be the lens that would cast the image on the back of the eye, in other words, on the retina. Let's see, E would be one of the humors, 
And in this case, it would be the vitreous humor, the fluid-filled chamber. Think of it as being the ventricle of the eye, if you will. G would be showing you the sclera, though I wish I could bring around more to the front. F would be the retina, and you can see where the retina is going to leave the eye back at H. That would be the optic nerve. Let's take the standard test for colorblindness, and if you fail it, we'll see what's wrong. So hopefully as you see this, you'll see in pinkish red the number 29. If you fail to see this, it is quite probable that you are colorblind. It might surprise you to know that most people do not know they're colorblind until they're tested. Most semesters I will get zero to one students that are colorblind. Uh, this past semester that I taught, I did have one student that was colorblind, and I asked him about it, he said his father was colorblind, and he saw the expression on my face of confusion, and he added, oh, I'm adopted. Uh, colorblindness is much more common in men, and it's carried on the X chromosome. Women have two X chromosomes, so they'd have to get a defective chromosome from both parents, which would be unlikely unless their parents maybe met at a convention for colorblind people. But for men, since they only receive one X chromosome on their 23rd pair from their mom, if their mom is a carrier, they could receive that faulty chromosome. They would not receive that from dad because dad and a son would only contribute the Y. If I lost you on that, it's okay. But again, the net and effect is that it's a trait colored, carried on the X chromosome and is therefore much more common in women. Uh, women are, in terms of being the carriers, it's much more common, but the actual sufferers are more likely to be men. So let's consider the retina and tie it to color vision. The retina carries our neurons for vision, that is our sensory neurons, which includes rods, cones, and other cells we'll be less concerned with. The rods and cones are pictured on this slide. The rods have a rod-like shape and cones have a cone-like shape. How do they work? Basically the same way. When light passes through all the structures that we mentioned, light will eventually get to the retina and the light will strike the rods and the cones. This stimulates the rods and the cones. And what happens when you stimulate a neuron? Well, neurons do as neurons do and stimulated neurons fire. They have action potentials. And this way, this action potential will be passed out of the eye via the optic nerve. So that's our similarity. They're both stimulated by light. They both have action potentials. Uh, what is the difference? Well, let's consider rods versus cones. Cones have a few advantages. One, they give us color vision. So if you have good quality color vision, thank your cones. If you have deficient color vision, well, the problem lies in your cones. They also give us highly acute vision. Species with cones see much better than species that lack cones. Birds, for example, in general see much better than humans. They have more cones. But most species, most nocturnal species, actually have more rods. The advantage of the rod is that the rod does not require a whole lot of light to work. Rods can work in fairly dim conditions. Nocturnal creatures, in fact, do not have cones at all because they would not be able to operate in the insufficient light. So color blindness then would be a color condition of lacking proper cones. Now consider this cute little dog, this old Dalmatian, blue-eyed. Its species does not typically have blue eyes. If you go see it in an animal shelter perhaps, it will probably be labeled special needs. Can you guess its sensory issue? Well, you might want to say a visual issue, but no, it is actually very likely to be deaf. Blue eyes, in a species that is not typically blue-eyed, that particular genetic material often is carried on the same allele, in the same ballpark of the gene, as deafness. So be wary of the blue-eyed dog that's not normally blue-eyed. They need homes too, but they are much more difficult to train, and they do tend to bark quite a bit. But they need homes too. So how do other species see the world? When you go to these two websites, you'll get your answer. One focuses specifically on the dog, which might help you to answer the question on the bottom. Uh, you might have 
been accidentally buying your dog toys for a long time, which your dog perceives as being brown. Uh, probably not exciting to your dog. Uh, so watch one of these websites to find about your dog visual preference. And another website will cover many, many species. I think you'll find them both very interesting. Many students find this demonstration to be particularly interesting. I get a lot of oohs and ahs. Before we get started, please place your hand on your mouse so you can click it without looking down. Now sit back comfortably and look at the white dot on the screen in the center of the flag. You're allowed to blink, but be relaxed, but keep your eyes fixed on this white dot. And while I speak to you, things will be happening in your eye. When I'm done with this narration, you'll be clicking and going to the next slide, which is white. And what you'll see there, if all goes well, is a very faint image of a flag. We call this an after image. But the flag that you'll be seeing on the next slide it will not be in the same colors. It will be in complementary colors. It is termed a negative after image. So let's pause a few more seconds. And when you're ready, go ahead and click. Expect to see a very faint image. It's not going to roar out at you, but you should see a faint image. If it doesn't work for you, go back and spend maybe a full minute looking at the white dot. But most students see it very nicely at about 30 seconds, which we've already surpassed. So go ahead and click. Just a few eye conditions. We discuss color blindness. Hopefully you note they're associated with issues of the cones. We noted cataracts, the condition when the lens clouds over, and we mentioned glaucoma, a condition associated with too much pressure in the vitreous humor. I'd like to show you what the person sees when they have these conditions. Consider the picture on the top left. That's hopefully your vision. Uh, nice, bright, clear, colored. On the right, it's rather fuzzy. This would what would a person would see that was in the earlier stages of cataracts. Bottom left, in the center where you would like to look at the picture, the image has been destroyed. You would try to look at the center of the picture using your fovea, or another term for the same sort of area as the macula. So if you ever heard of the eye condition macular degeneration, this is what that person would see due to, the, again, the destruction of the macula. On the bottom right, you'll see that most of the peripheral part of the image is missing. That's what the person would see if they have glaucoma. Before we go on to our next sense, the sense of audition, let's review the sense of vision. Visible light, which for humans would not include ultraviolet or infrared, Visible light will pass through our cornea, hopefully clear and unscarred. It will pass through the pupil. It will pass through the lens, which will focus it on the retina. The retina contains many cells, including the rods and the cones. When the light strikes our rods and cones, our photoreceptors in other words, they will respond, as all neurons do, by having action potentials. The action potential will then leave the eye through the optic nerve and will go to the sensory relay center. Let's do a review here. Was the sensory relay center the thalamus, hypothalamus, or hippocampus? Hopefully you said the thalamus. The thalamus will then relay it to the outer wrinkled surface of the brain. Take a moment, what was that? Hopefully you're thinking cerebral cortex. And last question, which lobe of the cerebral cortex would it go to since it's visual information? Was it occipital or optical lobe? Hopefully you went with occipital. So the information will be processed in the occipital lobe and perception will occur. So we'll momentarily see how you did. Hopefully you noticed the blanks and tried to fill them in at the same time. So either 5, 7, 9, 10, 21 or more senses. You smell something. That would be sensation. This happens when you're was it your motor, sensory, or inner neurons? Hopefully you said sensory neurons in your, and what's the name of that bulb? Olfactory bulb. So it's when your sensory neurons and your olfactory bulb are stimulated and send the action potential, that is the neuron messages, to your brain. And which lobe of the brain would it get sent to? 
hopefully you went with the frontal lobe. When you interpret that smell and you say, it's, it's the fire alarm, okay, that would be a perception. The rods and cones are part of the eyes. Will it be the retina? And would it be sense sensation or perception? Hopefully you went with sense. So retina and sense. The taste of pistachio ice cream. Perception would be the interpretation of that particular complex combinations of sensations. The body or somatic or somatosensory or skin senses. So that would be sense and the number three sense, sensation, and perception. Uh, how did you do on that? Hopefully very well. I always enjoy showing this particular slide in class. Uh, students are always shocked that everybody doesn't see it with the images they see it. Why we see it in different colors has to do with unconscious assumptions that your brain is making. Some people spend much more time in outside natural light. Others spend much more time under fluorescent light. Apparently the brain makes assumptions as to the conditions of the stock and depending on where you spend most of your times, you'll see one color versus the other color. This is actually according to real research, by the way.